Hi guys and welcome to week 7 of Introduction to Mechanical and Automotive Engineering. I'm your lecturer, Dr Elizabeth Kiriakou, and today we're going to take a look at the mechanical properties of materials in terms of stress and strain. So the engineering design of our buildings or machines, we need to consider the mechanical properties of the material such as the strength and the rigidity. In the case of static designs such as buildings and bridges, excessive distortions cannot be tolerated where fracture is uncommon and complete collapse of structures is a result of large deformations. In this course, we have studied so far the principles of statics to determine the resultant force and the moment acting on a body subject to external forces under equilibrium conditions. We have solved problems whereby analyze, analyzing the relationship between um, the external loads applied to a rigid body and the intensity um, of the internal forces acting within the body. So in this lecture, um, we will review the mechanical properties of materials in terms of stress and strain. So stress is associated with the strength of the material and the strain is a measure of the deformation of a body. The mechanical properties of materials plays a very important role in the design and analysis of mechanical systems and engineering products. So understanding the material choices and the characteristics is essential to industries like automotive or aerospace where there are benefits of um, structural material selection such as in vehicle design where we have the potential to reduce the weight by substituting heavier materials like iron and steel with lighter materials like magnesium and aluminium and more recently composite polymers. So it is important to understand the behaviour of materials in mechanical systems subjected to loads under operation. The elastic modulus of the material describes the deflection of the material under load and the strength of the material determines the stresses that it can withstand before it fails. The ductility of the material determines whether a material will fail as it is loaded beyond its elastic limit. So we're going to take a look right now at um, four sections to this um, lecture. The first is looking at the um, mechanical properties um, of materials. We'll take a look at the different types of loadings and we've looked at most of those so far in the course. Thirdly, we'll take a look at stress and strain. And finally, we're going to look at tensile properties. And this relates back to um, our tensile testing laboratory and being able to um, draw a uh, stress strain curve. So if we start with the mechanical properties of materials, we are looking at materials that reveal its elastic and inelastic behaviour, so its plastic behaviour, um, when a force is applied to a system. Um, it's an indication of the material's suitability for load bearing for mechanical applications and the most common uh, properties considered are the fatigue limit which describes the high stress that a material can withstand for an inf infinite number of cycles without breaking. Um, the hardness of a material, so the resistance of a material to plastically deform. Modulus of elasticity, which we will um, go into more depth later on, but that's also known as um, Young's modulus. And this is a measure of the stiffness of a material in the elastic range. And we also have the tensile strength of the material. So the tensile strength looks at the forces on a body that tends to um, stretch or elongate the body. And we've looked at tensile forces uh, previously. Um, the yield strength where the, it describes the maximum strength 
that can be applied before it begins to change um, shape permanently. And finally, the ductility of material. And this is the ability of a material to deform plastically without fracturing of an area during the tensile testing. So if we take a look at now the uh, material characteristics, um, what, so let's take a look at what's actually important when we look at material properties. So most structures, um, materials are isotropic. Well, actually, they're anisotropic. Anisotropic. So what does anisotropic mean? It means that the material properties are different in different directions of the material. So if I have a um, piece of wood and I have directional grain, that's the grain of the wood, and it's directional, I'm going to have different mechanical properties in this direction, so sigma 1, so the stress and the elastic modulus, and it's going to be different in this direction. So the the stress and the stiffness of the material will be different. For materials that we're looking at in this course, we're looking at materials that are actually going to be um, linear elastic. Um, isotropic, so that's the opposite of anisotropic. And thirdly, homogeneous. So, what do we mean by these terms? So, linear elastic looks at the, um, is another way of saying um, Hooke's law, whereby we have a relationship between the stress and strain of the material. And we can say that the elastic modulus is equal to the stress on the strain, and this is actually what we're going to be looking at today. Um, when we talk about isotropic, we look at, um, if I draw a piece of material, so here we had, in an isotropic, we had um, different properties in different directions. For an isotropic material, the properties are the same in each direction. So if we take a look at the stress, it's going to be the same everywhere. When we look at um, a homogeneous material, it means that the um, composition of the material is consistent. So we have a uniform um, composition. So um, all the mechanical systems that we look at um, in this class are linear elastic, isotropic and homogeneous. So we need um, Hooke's law to um, apply to these. There are other material properties um, that affect um, the material behaviour, such as the temperature, the rate of loading and um, other um, boundary conditions. So let's take a look at um, the different types of loadings. So the application of a force um, to an object is also known as loading. So materials are subjected to different types of loading and there are five fundamental um, types. So there's five um, fundamental loading conditions. So 
So we've looked at the first one um, in previous problems. So we have um, tension. And what's a tensile force? So if I have an object and I'm pulling apart the force, then my system is subject to um, tensile forces and tensile stress. The second one is compression. And in compression, what do we have? We have the pressing together of the material. Um, third, we have bending. And in bending, we have a we have a bend, and we have some supports at the end, and we apply a load to that beam. It's after the beam will bend. And on one side of the beam, we're going to have compression. And on the other side of the beam, we're going to have tension. The next type of loading we have is <coughs> shear. Where if we have a beam, okay, and we have supports at the end, and if we cut this beam, and if we have forces along that plane, then this will be our shear force. And finally, which we'll look at in week 10 of semester, is torsion. And torsion is a twisting force. So if this is my my beam or my shaft, it's actually going to twist. So this is a twisting force. So five fundamental um, types of loading, which we'll, we use continuously um, throughout this course. So let's take a look at um, stress and strain. So what is stress? Stress is a measure of a material strength. Okay. So stress is a measure of the material's strength. And if I have a beam, and I apply a tensile force, so we're going away from the body, and if I take a section through AA, I'm going to have a cross-sectional area. So in 3D it's actually going to look like this. And this is going to be my cross-sectional area. And my force is coming out like this. So in this case, I have a uniform cross-sectional area going through the beam. So if I take a section, and we remember when we did internal loads, so if I have my beam again, and I've taken a section at AA, and I have a force here. This is my cross-sectional area at A. I'm going to have 
in A. So a normal force. Or a tensile force, and I'm going to have a V, a, a shear force. So the intensity of the force acting on that surface is actually called the stress. So I can redraw that to be. F and from my normal force, I'm going to have a stress acting on that surface. So I can say that stress sigma, so sigma equals the force divided by the cross-sectional area. So that's my force and this is my cross-sectional area. And what are our units? The unit for force is newtons. Um, the units for area is metres squared and that means that we can relate that back to it's called a pascal. So stress is measured in pascals. So, I have two scenarios. I have a normal force or a tensile force and I have a shear force. So, if I think about this, I'm actually going to have a tensile stress or a normal stress and I'm going to have a shear stress. So, let's take a look. So if I take, if I have a rod and I apply a force and on this side I'm going to have a normal force, that means I'm going to have a normal stress distribution on that surface. So it's going to be a normal stress distribution. So I can say that sigma equals N on A. So it's exactly the same formula. The only difference now is we've just called that a normal force. If I have the same rod or shaft and I have a force being applied to it and I'm looking at a shear force, V, what type of stress am I going to generate? I'm going to generate a shear stress. And we denote shear stress as tau. So tau equals V on A. And my units are always pascals. So tau is my shear stress. V is my shear force. And A is the cross-sectional area. So the cross-sectional area for both is going to be exactly the same. The only thing that changes is the type of force that we are applying to the system. So what we need to look at now is um, tensile stress and compressive stress. So if I have a beam and I apply a force to it, 
if my fault, if my stress is going away from the beam, sigma, then I'm going to have tensile stress. Bring my beam up again. Here's my force being applied. And if I go towards the beam, then my stress is going to be compressive stress. And this is going to be determined by my normal force and my shear force. So for all the all these problems that we're looking at, my material must be linear elastic, isotropic, and homogeneous. So what happens if I actually vary the cross-sectional area? Because right now, all my areas are uniform. So this describes uniform cross-sectional area. So if it's not uniform, what's going to happen? I'm going to actually have an integral. So my force is going to be an integral of the stress dA. But in, I think, all the problems that we solve, we're looking at um, uniform cross-sectional areas. So let's take a look at um, strain. So just remember that stress is a measure of the material's strength and is measured in pascals. So let's take a look at strain. So, strain. And strain is a measure of materials deformation. So we can change the size and the shape of the body. So we're changing. shape and size of the body. So, I have, if I have a body, I have a beam, and I apply a force to it, I can actually change the length of the material. If I have a body, I can also change the shape of the body. Okay, so here is the change in the body shape. Um, if I have bending, again, I'm changing, I can change the shape of the beam. And finally, if I have a 
a body and I apply a shear force to it. So this is our normal force. If I apply a shear force to it, so again this way, I can change the shape of the body. So here we have linear or direct strain. So we have linear or direct strain. And strain, and that's taken from our normal force. And we call that epsilon. So if I have my beam and I've changed the, the shape, apply the force because I've applied a force to each side. My material has an original length. And here, this is the changing length. And we can also call that E. So that is the, um, we can call that the, that's the changing length or the elongation. So I can say that strain in the material is equal to the changing length on the original length. So we can also say E on L. So strain here is denoted by epsilon. If we take a look at shear strain, what do we have? Here is my material, and here we have shear strain. And shear strain is denoted by gamma. So we have our force that's being applied in the shear direction, the shear plane. And shear strain is defined as the change in angle. So here, that is gamma. So the shear force is actually, the shear strain is actually an angle and it's measured in radians. So if I have, this is my Elongation. This is my original length. And I can say that the shear strain is equal, so gamma is equal to E on L. And we describe it as an angle. And this is the angle of distortion. So depending on, so if we have a, a box here or a beam and this is underformed and then if we apply a shear force to it, B, We generate an angle of gamma, and this will be described in terms of pi on 2. So we can just add up um, the answers here. So in this case, it's going to be um, pi on 2 minus gamma, and 
ones. If we go in the other direction, force going in this direction we're going to it's going to look like this and if that's my angle gamma it's going to be from here it becomes prime to plus gamma because we've got a got this part and this part So it's actually strain. So gamma is actually strain. It's an angle and it's measured in radians. That's why we have our pies on twos. Okay. So let's just take a quick look at stress concentrations. So if we could take a look at the stress concentration of the material. What does the um, distribution look like? So if I have a piece of material that's uniform and we have a um, force applied to it, stress it's just going to be uniform. So here we have uniform stress. And that's my stress distribution. But what happens if I change um, this plate? So if I now take this plate So up here, sigma equals F1A. So if I now have a hole in the middle of this plate, what have I done? I've effectively changed the area. So I've actually changed the cross-sectional area. So I've actually reduced it. Yeah. So if I reduce the area, what's going to happen to my stress? It's going to increase. Yeah. So stress equals F1A. If this is small, it becomes big. So what does my stress distribution look like? So far away from the hole, I'm going to have uniform distribution. But as I go closer to this, I'm actually changing what the stress distribution looks like. Yeah. So this is my stress distribution. And what and if I take if I cut this through that section there, what am I going to do? My stress distribution, and I have it load, and force that's being applied to it. Around the hole, I'm going to have a higher sigma, a higher stress, and that's where my stress will be maximum. And as I go further away, my stress will reduce. And this is similar to what we've been looking at um, when we're doing the rivets um, in our bridge design. So this is a stress distribution.
So, the last thing we need to take a look at is the um, tensile properties. Okay, tensile properties. So, from our tensile testing, we can establish a relationship between the stress and the strain. So, stress and strain relationship. Okay, and um, if we um, take a look at, well, we've looked at what um, tensile is. Tensile is taking a material and pulling it apart. So when we do a tensile um, test, if we have a material and we apply a load to each side, we want to know what happens to the material. And that determines the material properties. So, when we're doing a um, tensile testing laboratory, we end up with the load of material, load applied in newtons, and the elongation, and that's in um, metres. So, how do I turn a elongation load curve into a stress and strain curve. So if I have the load, and if I know the cross-sectional area um, of my material, which is going to be here, so that's my cross-sectional area, I can calculate the, strain, the stress. So sigma equals the load F on A, and that's in Pascal's. From the elongation, I can calculate stress, the strain of the material, so the deformation of the material. So epsilon is going to equal E, the change in length, or the elongation, divided by the original length. And that has no units. Why does strain have no units? Strain equals the elongation, which is in metres, divided by the original length, and that's also in metres. They cancel out, and so strain has no units. So from the tensile testing um, laboratory, we end up with um, a series of stresses and strains. And what do we end up with? We end up with a stress-strain curve. So here we have on this side we have stress, sigma, and I think Pascal's. On this side we have strain, epsilon, and that has no units. So I end up with a curve It's going to look like this. And this is typical for mild steel. So what are the characteristics of this curve? Here I have at the beginning This area here is linear elastic. And if I take the gradient of that curve, I'm going to have, my pen's not working, take the 
gradient of that curve, I'm going to have stress on strain. And that is equal to our Young's modulus, or the modulus of elasticity. So, B equals stress on strain. And that's my modulus of elasticity and it's a measure of stiffness. For this to um, apply, my material must be linear elastic, isotropic and homogeneous. So, we can call that B. And this range here is called the elastic region. And when we talk about elastic region or elastic behaviour, we're talking about a material that can return to its um, original shape once the load has been taken off. Okay? So the material um, returns to its original shape. It's a bit low. once the load is applied, um, removed. Okay. And then, from this point, so this is my um, elastic limit, and this is going to give me my yield stress, And um, we also have, so then from this point onwards to where my material fails, that's my failure point, is called the plastic region. And what happens in the plastic region? In the plastic region, you have plastic behaviour. means that we have permanent deformation of material. So this point here is the ultimate tensile strength. It's also called UTS, and this is the maximum stress that the material can withstand before failure. So there's a few points in this graph that are very important, and then the last thing we need to look at is in this what happens to the material in this region. So in here, we have something called necking. And what's necking? If this is my tensile testing piece, what happens? Necking is when I have reduction in the cross-sectional area here. And then at failure, what happens at failure? So this is necking. And 
here. That's my. Okay. Failure is going to be where this breaks. That's my failure point. That's where it breaks. So these are the characteristics of a stress strain curve. So we always need to remember that Young's modulus occurs in our linear elastic region. Um, what we need to look at now is um, what happens if we have axial strain. So let's take a look. Okay, so if we have um, actual strain, what do you mean by axle? It's just in the direction of the axis. So if I have a material and I apply a load to it, my material will either stretch or it will compress. So we want to know um, we want to determine the deformation material. And we can do this by using Poisson's ratio. And Poisson's ratio describes, so new describes the elongation in the lateral direction divided by the elongation in the longitudinal direction. So here we have the um, lateral and longitudinal. Yep. So this is a ratio. The last thing that um, we need to look at is, um, remember we took a look at um, Young's modulus and we said that stress, that the Young's modulus is equal to the stress on the strain. If we want to take a look at the shear modulus, okay, of stiffness and 
is a measure of the rigidity of material. So I'm going to have, so the shear modulus is G, and it's also in Pascals. And it's with my tau, my shear stress. divided by gamma, my shear strain. So, there is a relationship between Young's modulus and the shear modulus. And we can do that using so the relationship between the two, we're going to write this, is described by Poisson's ratio. So E is equal to 2G on 1 plus mu. So that's Young's modulus. modulus and that is possible for it here. So we can describe the relationship between the two with the, the um, relationship between the elongation of the material in each in its latitudinal and longitudinal directions. And the final thing that we need to look at is the ductility of the material. Okay. So the ductility of the material, if we go back to the stress-strain curve, is described by the elongation of the material and the reduction in the area. So, when we were looking at the stress-strain curve and here's my failure point, the, the ductility of the material and it describes um, the elongation and what's the elongation of the material? So if here is my tensile test piece and we're at fracture, so it's broken. If I take the original material and measure, is this the original material? When I measure the gauge length, so this length, and I join the two broken parts together, and I measure the gauge length again, so that's going to be call that two, call that one, or original. The elongation is um, a ratio, so it's going to be change in length on the original length okay and that is represented in form of a um, percentage um, when you're looking at um, then the other property for ductility is the reduction in area and where does the reduction in area occur in cross-sectional area and that occurs here during the necking. So if we have the original material and we have the 
material here at Neki, where you're going to have this occurring. It is a ratio of this area, that cross-sectional area, divided by the original area. So it's going to be um, the new area divided by original area. And that's also expressed um, as a percentage. So hopefully we have a, um, um, a nice idea now of um, the mechanical properties that are imported, the characteristics of material properties that we're looking at, make sure that our material properties are always going to be linear elastic, so it's um, the relationship, we have the relationship between the stress and the strain, and it obeys Hooke's law, the material needs to be linear elastic, isotropic, so the properties are the same um, in each direction, and also um, a homogeneous material where the um, consistency or the composition of the material is uniform. We took a look at, a load at um, the different types of loads from um, um, tensile forces, compressive forces, shear forces, bending forces and um, torsion, which we'll look at in week 10 of semester, and how to generate and the analysis of a stress-strain curve. So I'm going to leave it there for today and um, I'll see you in lectorial.